As those of us in this profession engage in this process of review and definition, recommendation and implementation, some historic context is in order, and it also requires the vigilance and the increased attention of our viewers and readers. First, this new universe is far more egalitarian than in the days when a handful of press, load, press lords pursued their own political agendas. William Randolph Hearst, Colonel Robert R. McCormick, the Chandlers in Los Angeles, and Henry Luce at Time, Inc., were in journalism, it turns out, not just for public service, but for profit and fulfillment of their personal political ideologies. Edward R. Murrow was an icon to all of us who followed him, but Walter Winchell was at least as persuasive, if not more so, to his audience, which was at least as large, if not more so. We've lived through the O.J. Simpson trial, the funeral of Princess Diana, and recently to much greater length than I would have appreciated, Anna Nicole Smith. <laughs> but the Lindbergh trial, the Sam Shepard murder case, and the marriage of Wallace Simpson to the Duke of Windsor created the same climate of frenzy. We may have known too much about Bill Clinton's sex life, but not enough about the sex life of John F. Kennedy. Does anyone believe that Adolf Hitler in the era of modern communication and information could have prevailed for as long as he did? There were more debates in the presidential campaign of 2004 than in all the campaign years in modern presidential election history. Sunday morning has become a regular appointment for students of American politics and policy well beyond what it was during the era when Meet the Press and Face the Nation were the only outlets. Even as the quantitative expansion of this new universe is breathtaking in scope, it is the qualitative nature of the new reality that draws us to this occasion and others. Does it really represent a step forward in the unending quest to know the perils and possibilities of the precious time that we have in this life, or is it a retreat to the lowest common denominators of fear and titillation? I believe that the short answer is all of the above. Just as in Alice's Restaurant, you can find these days anything that you want. The news viewer is empowered as never before to explore a wide range of interests, to personally determine his or her own daily informational needs and curiosities. But for that viewer and reader, and those of us on the other side of the screen, the old order of trust, credibility, integrity, and independence require constant and vigorous re-examination. It's especially true given the pressures of time and the meteor shower of information real and imagined in modern and personal lives and what I have determined since I left the nightly news chair, a growing cancer of a very short attention span in America. It is under assault every hour because of a simple fact. The new order has a voracious appetite for something, too often anything to fill the time. That, in turn, has led to what can only be called mob journalism. It's not an entirely new phenomenon, the gathering of all parts of the journalistic tribe around an event, manufactured or spontaneous, but it is seldom reporting in the classic sense. It is more closely akin to daycare. It is a live camera, a warm body, and an event, any kind of an event, however banal, that may or may not lead to something meaningful or entertaining, preferably the latter. That is not to say that the various new media must be restricted entirely to a diet of eat your spinach news. They do have the time and space to do what television does best, which is to transmit experience. In the words of Reuben Frank, the founding father of the Huntley Brinkley Report, Mr. Frank was a bookish, intellectual, and visionary, but he also reminded all of us that it was not our place to be above the news. What he expected, however, is that in the transformation of experience and in the coverage of news, however unsavory the topic, the fundamental tenets of journalism would have application. Why should we care or not care? Is this an isolated development or part of a larger context? What is there beyond what we are currently showing you on the screen or on the front page? It is that application of journalistic principle that is missing or underrepresented in too much of what we especially see in this new universe. 
Those principles are the compact that we have with our viewers. It is what they expect of us, and we should expect no less of ourselves. Indisputably, the time and competitive pressure are greater now for the readers, the viewers, and those in the cockpit. If I may, a brief outline of the Brokaw theorem of the new law of journalistic principles and physics. A piece of matter of undetermined origin, reliability, or importance gets sucked in to the news cycle somehow overnight. A joke, a rumor, a rumor on the internet, an urban legend of some kind, a piece of gossip. It then gets picked up in the early morning talk radio circuit, where fact check is more likely to be the name of the female traffic reporter than a standard practice. <laughs> Imus is talking to Charles about it all morning long, and Bernie is chiming in. By mid-morning, all the news cable outlets are treating it as an unsubstantiated report. It's now making its way out of the local news broadcast. It's also the stuff of newsroom water cooler gatherings. By late afternoon, it is giving my colleagues in my old office a migraine. Where in the hell did this come from, they're asking. <laughs> it must be something, because there it is now on the late afternoon cable news, free for all. A former U.S. attorney or a campaign press secretary or a red meat ideologue or a drip dye dry think tank habitué is co commenting knowingly on this unknown matter. It's difficult enough for those of us who are in positions of responsibility, especially in broadcast news, but also these days in the editorial offices of the great print outlets. Consider the viewer and the reader, especially those with access to what amounts to an internet chain letter. He or she could be taking it in off the large screen and immediately transferring it to the small screen and passing it along. And very quickly, it hits critical mass. It is a peril enhanced by the ever greater blurring of the line between what the role of reputable and well-established reporters in the mainstream is and the place of so-called pundits and commentators on cable talk radio and now in the vast universe of the blogosphere. Even the most discerning viewer or reader must be confused by the slippery place of journalists who appear on one medium as reporters and a moment later on another medium as commentators and pundits. So what are we to make of this new world where there is a great anxiety about whether the Darwinian principles of journalism are leading forward to a bright new age of unlimited news and information dissemination? Or is it a retreat, a steep dive into a primordial ooze? Personally, I am much more inclined to the former than the latter. I think we must take care not to judge the whole by the most sensational but least significant parts. I like to remind audiences on occasions such as this that Bill O'Reilly, who gets a good deal of attention for his broadcast every night on Fox, on his very best night, has one quarter of the audience of just one of the broadcast evening broadcasts news broadcast. Still, even in an age and at a stage when I would prefer to shift to cruise control, I know that neither I nor my colleagues in print or on over the air can go on autopilot. We're not immune to the great evolutionary forces at work in our medium, as it, as it is a new world for health care providers, for warriors, educators, politicians, businessmen and women, spiritual leaders, so too is this transformational technology a new world for us. It is much more competitive. The marketplace, journalistic and economic, is much less forgiving. The audience is not nearly as homogenous as earlier stewards may have thought. Young people are finding their own way to get the information that they need, and it seldom is coming from mainstream newspapers or the evening news broadcast. However, we organize our journalistic efforts and present the finished product, we still must be guided by certain well-defined and understood principles. Just as there are fundamental principles of astrophysics that govern the behavior of the real stars and planets, so too are there fundamental principles that govern or should govern our place and behavior. News has changed. What's new? What's different? But new alone is not enough. Is it important? If it is new and important, is it true? How do we determine and demonstrate the truth? 
If it is new, important, and true, what is the effect and what's the context? Where does it all fit? After all, daily journalism is also about the oh my God elements of life. The arresting picture, the unexpected and riveting event that may not have lasting consequences, the moment of humanity that is reassuring, the editorial cartoon. Finally, if it is new, important, and true, how do we present it in such a way that our viewers can be engaged by it and recognize it as something essential to their lives? Those principles are neither staid nor toxic. They are critical to the health of the profession and the bond between viewer and the news producers. They have not disappeared, but their place seems to have been diminished in the daily struggle to master this new universe, which is still in formation. While they may occasionally fray my fragile anchorman's ego, I also welcome the presence of designated press critics and ombudsmen in the public press. Bloggers that blabber I can do without. Bloggers that enlighten I welcome. But I am, un I am troubled and unnerved slightly by this phenomenon of bloggers banding together to form a jihad against someone or something with which they disagree. Moreover, I strongly believe that the place of my medium, especially in all of its forms, is so pervasive and influential, it does have an obligation now to receive as well as to send. In the past, I have participated in town meetings on the press in Phoenix, Pittsburgh, Minneapolis, and across America. I have never failed to come away with a better understanding of that vital but fragile link between my side of the screen and the viewers. Bloggers and the blogosphere can be a pest, but they also remind us that in this new world we're no longer just on send. We have to acknowledge the new powers that compel us also from time to time to be on receive, but to have a strong filter over the receive button so we know what we are getting is not just factual and not just ideological, but that it has real relevance to our daily lives. After almost 40 years in this profession, small towns and on the world stage, during times of constitutional crises, wars, natural disasters of epic proportions, social and economic upheaval, scientific triumphs, and great personal tragedies, I have one enduring and primary conclusion. The people take us seriously. We fulfill our obligation to them and to ourselves when we return the favor. They are empowered, and so are we, by the riches of this new universe that we occupy together. We have gone past that memorable 19th century Chicago newspaper credo, print the news and raise hell. While it remains a stirring rallying cry, the fact is that we live in a far more complex world of news and information. As this new world takes shape beneath our feet and our eyes on a daily basis, we cannot just randomly stumble forward guided only by the instincts for that day's survival. But neither can we be dismissive of the appetite of viewers and readers for a rich variety of choices engagingly presented, whether they are serious or tri trivial. We owe it to ourselves, our calling, our time and place to raise to a higher station a constant and wide-ranging dialogue on the place and conduct of this profession that is so vital to a free people. I hope that this evening has been an important part of that necessary colloquy. And let me just close on a personal note, if I may. I was in South Dakota over the weekend where we lost a beloved mentor to generations of students, a man who was the chair of the political science department at the University of South Dakota for seven decades. Six Rhodes Scholars, half the governors and the senators in the state, journalists, Soviet scholars as well, people who are in this city and across the academy in this country serving in political science. He was effervescent. I was his first journalist to graduate, and he was on my case constantly. <laughs> I was not what you would call one of his prize-winning students at the time, but he took a personal interest in me at one point telling me to drop out, get the wine, women, and song out of my system, <laughs> come back when I would do myself some good, the university some good, and relieve my parents of their anxiety. 
and I did that. <laughs> it took only a semester, not to get all the wine, women, and song out of my system, <laughs> but to get a healthy perspective on the world.